Yeah, I got it. Got it. All right. Got it. All right. There we go. So, um, like I said, my name is Roman Karchak. I've been running Roman with Roman Photo Tours for over 20 years now. I live down in Southwest Florida, uh, I, but I was 13 miles outside of New York City until about a year and a half ago. Uh, but landscapes have always been my first love and uh, night photography really caught my attention. But like I said, in 2011, I was doing it with an F4 lens. Uh, and now lenses have changed, camera bodies have changed, and all that other good stuff. If you would like to follow me on, uh, okay, one of them is going to work, on social media, for those of you, you know, you can take a screenshot of this. On Facebook, I post the specs when I post an image. On Instagram, it's just look at the pretty picture, you know, whatever. Um, I am starting to do more stuff since I've moved down, mostly here in Florida. Uh, I'm actually going to do a night shoot probably on the East Coast. So uh, just email me or follow me and you'll figure it out. Uh, so here's my, you want to take a screenshot of this, um, but look what number one is, sturdy tripod and ball head. I'm telling you right now that for night photography, your exposure is going to be 15 to 30 seconds, uh, for Milky Way. Uh, to an hour or more for star trails. So you need that sturdy tripod. Uh, camera with high ISO capabilities, all the new cameras have that capability. And they also have bulb. I'm still keeping F4 because not everybody can afford the F2.8 or the F1.4 lenses. It works, and the new cameras have much better high ISO capability. Wide angle is your friend. The wider, the faster, the better. And I don't want to leave you micro four thirds people out, but I know there's a lot of eight millimeter lenses on up. So, you know, you have your options as well. Cable release for my. I'm going to talk to you about blending exposures, but for my uh, hour or more uh, exposures, uh, I use a simple cable release, nothing fancy, because anything battery operated can lose it. So I use a mechanical one. You push the button, you lock it, walk away from it, go take a nap in your car, and it's all good. Uh, and then I'll talk to you about blending images. Bubble level for the hot shoe. I know all cameras have the level built in on them, but it eats up battery. Um, it's That's why it's fallen down on the list, uh, because it's not a necessity, because I know every camera, digital camera has it. Uh, so that's why, you know, but it helps you make it quicker when you're setting up and not eat up your battery because I know the new mirrorless cameras especially eat up battery. Compass, and my son said, hey, dad, there's an app for that to find a North Star. Uh, that's because I'm trying to do the uh, star trails. Uh, your car has a compass on it. Uh, so not necessary. That's why it's fallen down list. Uh, my son is now 28 years old, and I said, uh, so son, you're smart. Where's the app when your phone is dead or you have no signal? So, you know, use your car, use an app on your phone if you have signal. Uh, but a lot of areas that I go to, we don't have that. Headlamp or flashlight with spare batteries, I carry both. I like to walk out to my location with a headlamp to keep my hands free. 
my gear is in a backpack usually, tripod in one hand, uh, and good ankle support. Take your time when you're going out there at night. Um, you know, you don't want to fall, bust your knees, bust your ankle, bust your wrist, any of that other good stuff. So lens options, there's a thousand of them now. So I'm giving you a general scale. For full frame cameras, mirrorless or, you know, digital, I like the 14 to 20 millimeter range uh, in the 1.4 to 2.8 range. Why do I like that range? because it allows me to keep my ISO lower, okay? Doesn't mean I don't like the 11 to 24 F4 or you know the 14 to 24 F4 or 2.8 because they're great. But again, I'm gonna have to raise my ISO, which on today's digital cameras is not that big of a deal. If you're having issues with noise, Look into topaz denoise. I highly recommend it. Um, so for crop sensor, 10 to 20, 16 millimeter. Uh, micro four thirds, 7 to 14, 8 millimeters. You have options today like you didn't have a decade ago. So these are just some of your options. Oh, you definitely want to take a picture of this. We used to call it the rule of 500. Because of all the extra megapixels they're cramming into these camera bodies, um, we've lowered it to 400. So 400 divided by the focal length gives you your shutter speed. So I'm full frame camera. 400 divided by 20 millimeter lens gives me a 20 second shutter speed. So this thing is huge. This is what has revolutionized uh, night photography. This is a 12 millimeter shot. Uh, this is out in Monument Valley. This is an F4 lens. I'm at ISO 6400, and because I'm on Navajo land with a Navajo guide, I'm able to light paint this humongous monolith, uh, but this is what I'm talking about. If you don't face south, southwest, you're going to get stars, but you're not going to get the Milky Way. Uh, this is outside of Nelson, Nevada. This is a, a ghost town. Uh, um, it's a former mine outside of Vegas. And I spent more time actually putting in the kids' glow stick in the cars, the gas containers, than I actually did take in the picture. But if you want the Milky Way, and that that what you see on your right is called the galactic core. That is usually from mid to late March through mid to late September. That's where you're going to see it depending on your latitude. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, you won't see the core in January, February, you know, October, November, December, January, and February, you're not going to see that core in most places. You'll still see the left side of it, but you're not going to see that core. So no to little moon, quarter moon to your naked eye. You see a quarter moon, half of the half, you're good. It's going to light paint your foreground. Heavy clouds will ruin the image. You know, if you got a few clouds, it's just going to look like a long exposure in water. At these high S ISOs, you want to stop about start about two hours after sunset and two hours before sunrise. So 
typically when I'm out in the field and I want to do night photography, I'll wait for sunset, do my sunset blue hour shots, go have dinner, and then go out and do night photography an hour and a half later. Light pollution. Yeah, I lived in New Jersey 57 years of my life. Uh, it's tough where we live. Uh, there are websites that tell you where dark skies are. And I'm talking about this as a landscape photographer. I want a foreground subject, don't care what it is. Uh, but I'm adding that to the scene. And yeah, number six, the lawyers made me do it. You know, you want to take your time when you're out there and not trip and break body parts or camera gear. So this is my first post-processing tip. I'm a Canon shooter. I now have Sony's. I haven't done as much as night as I have with Canon bodies. Uh, so this is a silhouette. This is uh, North Window at uh, Arches National Park. Canon camera users, your noise in particular is going to be more magenta and red. Nikon shooters and Sony shooters, yours is going to be green and yellow. So if you're shooting raw, which you should be, you can go into the color mixer and take all that down and eliminate a vast majority of your noise. But like I said, if you can't get rid of all of it, Topaz denoise because it's worth the price. Little bit of clouds. This is a crescent moon that lit up these mountains. Okay. So again, you're getting stars. I'm not pointed at the Milky Way, but you're still getting the stars. This barn no longer exists. It's up in Keene, New York. Uh, this is when I went out with Nick to photograph this. That glow you see on the horizon, the orange glow uh, over the silhouetted mountain is the city of Lake Placid, 11 miles away from us. The field is lit by a street lamp on the highway, literally 100 feet to our right behind us. Uh, so we tried to do this. So again, you want to avoid man-made light as much as you can. And I didn't process this, but I could have gone into the color palette, toned them down and done everything else. This image is probably eight, nine years old. So now we have more tools where I can work on. The only successful Milky Way shot I've ever taken in New Jersey this is the judge's shack uh, on the beach, um, you know, and there's fishermen on the beach uh, burning a campfire. Uh, that's probably either Trenton or Philly in the distance that I've got. So I was able to pull this off in one shot a couple of years ago. Uh, but again, the Milky Way isn't as crisp as I would have liked. And that's because of light pollution. So the further you can get away from light pollution, the better you are. That moon that looks like a full moon is actually a crescent moon um, under, you know, White Sand Dunes National Park now. So again, the Milky Way isn't as prominent. And the only good news about having a small moon up is it'll show up the ripples on the sand. So if you go out to these places, go online and check the moon phases. This is what sold my book uh, over a decade ago. Nothing has changed. There is, you know, I know focus peaking, blah, 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 this and that. I'm going to save you a lot of time and effort. During broad daylight, focus on something. The lens you're going to use at night, pick your lens, put it on the camera, pick a subject 30 to 50 feet away from you. 
an autofocus on it. Take your cell phone. Take a picture of the infinity scale that's on the top, side, left, right, somewhere on your lens. Tape that ring down. I use sports tape like you did if you had an injury. It's not super sticky. You can use gaffer tapes. Now put it on manual focus. Guess what? You can go out all night as long as you don't get 30 to 50 feet closer to your subject. Everything will be in focus. I own all my lenses practically are zoom lenses. I have a couple of fixed focal lengths. Do not zoom. Set it on the widest it can get. And, you know, then you're going to get the shot. So, okay, that's the sideways figure eight is the infinity scale. Guess what? I've seen it to the left. I've seen it to the right. I've seen it on the L's. I've seen it everywhere under the sun. Test your lens and camera body during the day. And guess what? Now you know where to set it. And oh, by the way, by taking that cell phone shot, yes, by taking that cell phone shot of this, now you know that when you reach into your bag, you can look at it and say, oh my God, the tape moved a little bit. I need to put it back over there. And now you're not messing things up. And now you go from location to location to location and you can get the shot. So while you're home, that first website, depthoffieldmaster.com. You go online, you put in your camera body, the lens you're going to use, depth, uh, distance to subject. It'll tell you exactly how far you need to be away from it. And then you use the rule of 400. Lens divided by 400 gives you your shutter speed. But Depth of Field Master or Photo Pills, the only app that I bought that's 10 bucks that tells me when the Milky Way is going to rise. So I'm standing in the daytime at a location, pointed south, roughly south, start scrolling through night AR and say, oh, the Milky Way core is going to rise at 12.01 a.m. Now I'm not running around chasing things. Now I know when to be exactly at my location. This has revolutionized even after I've written a book a decade later. This is the northeast tail of the Milky Way. Again, not as prominent, but you still got stars and you've got constellations. And you've got cool stuff. And I'm going to talk to you about light painting in the parks because they banned it for groups, not for individuals. So this was the number two thing. And since the um, National Park has banned light painting, I don't tend to use this. But you might go to a place that's not a national park. Use a powerful flashlight because you're looking through the viewfinder and I'm going to point to the left and say, can you see that? Yeah, I'm going to point to the right. Can you see that? And I've got new batteries and flashlights. I admit to a flashlight fetish, but that is my favorite website to find them. So now you can quickly compose through the viewfinder and see it. I'm, I'm showing you a picture. I no longer own this thing. I bought it 12 years ago for my night photography. TSA used to leave me love letters with it. It was the most powerful flashlight at the time. The cool name, Thorex, 10 million candle power. Still don't know what that means. It had an incandescent light bulb and it was massive. That incandescent light bulb made it more yellow, okay? Moonlight is not yellow. So today's newer LED lights, again, this is one of the bigger ones. I'm not going to tell you what I paid for it. More 
cold color, which is more moonlit. So any LED light that you have now makes it more natural. But I pointed it on the left. Can everybody see that? Pointed it on the bush in the front. Well, make sure you don't got too much of that. Pointed it on the right. Everybody can see that. Now we can compose within a couple of seconds. That's my newest one. It's super powerful. And the first huge one that I showed you, uh, it lasted 45 minutes on a 16 hour charge. This thing lasts for six hours on a two hour charge. So this is where, again, everything has progressed. So now I've told you how to do the Milky Way. So now I'm going to tell you how to do star trails. Same thing, F4, faster. Oh, no, this is the Milky Way. Sorry, I, I'm ahead of myself. So the Milky Way, F4 or faster, ISO 6400. And again, but you're talking about 20 second exposures here. Take one at ISO 6400. Take one at, I don't care if you're shooting at F4. Take one at ISO 6400. Take one at ISO 3200. Take one at ISO 1600. Take one at ISO 800. It's costing you a lot of 20, 40, 60, 80, 80 seconds. You know, not even two minutes. Remember the rule of 400. What I've learned with using ultra wide angle lenses, though, is on my star trails, if you've noticed, the outside has longer trails. Well, so when I took my Milky Way shots and I was at 25 seconds with my 14 millimeter, I was noticing some trails and people were saying, oh, that's coma, chromatic aberration. No, it was, that's the nature of the beast. So I shortened my time to a 14 millimeter to 20 seconds. So if I'm using a 12, I'm going to shorten my exposure time. What's the difference between every stop of light? Well, okay, so this is the northeast tail of the Milky Way in February. Yeah, that's quite a bit, you know, if you go back and forth. So again, this is from over a decade ago. I trust my new cameras today to be much better. Um, this is February 8th or 9th. It's eight degrees outside. Uh, I went out with Dave DeRocher uh, to Arches shortly after the Giants won the Super Bowl. I was still shooting film, but I just got my first digital camera. And, you know, so that's how much I'm trying to tell you. I am facing Southwest. So if you go here in April, May, June, uh, you're going to have the full-blown Milky Way. The only problem is you're going to have about 900 people with you today, but it's still doable. And you're going to be hiking up at night or sunset. So I don't know why I didn't put this in the first book. It's, you know, my digital camera has had ISO 25,600 from the time I bought it. I have one DXs. Um, am I ever going to use 25,000? Yeah, no. Except now, instead of using a flashlight, I show you a monolith right in front of us and say, point that way. You put it on ISO 25,600 or higher. They go up to 100,000, 200,000. 20 seconds, you're going to have your image and it's going to look like broad daylight. Now, you're not going to use this for anything, but it's going to help you compose quickly. Again, in 20 seconds, you're going to say, oh, I got to raise it up. I got to move it right. I got to move it left, move it. So now in a couple of minutes, 
with those high ISOs, not blinding yourself, not wrecking your night blindness, you're going to be able to compose quickly. So again, you, you've got these things, and I'm going to talk about light painting and everything else like that. This is White Dome Geyser. You're going to see a bunch of images of this. But you know, once I've got the star points nailed in, my lens is taped down. I can go image to image to image to image to image, no matter where I go. And, you know, once you took your first image and let's say I'm at ISO 3200 F2.8, blah, blah, blah. It's not going to change from location to location unless you're talking about canyons or other things like that. So now you're an expert on Milky Way photography. And oh, by the way, I told you from late March through late September. So what happens in all our national parks in June, July, August, September? Fires, smoke. My last two times out to the Pacific Northwest, we couldn't even see the shoreline. We couldn't even see the mountain. Humidity plays a huge part in it. So, you know, New Jersey summers are very humid. So if you want to go out and do that judge's shack, my recommendation to you is check the humidity levels before you head out. The lower the humidity, the more likely you're not going to get that twinkling and moving stars. So, you know, just keep that in mind. So now you know how to do the Milky Way. Let's do star trails. For the record, and I'm saying this now, wintertime is my favorite time to do star trails. Why? Because mine is one shot in camera. I push the button, leave it locked open for an hour or more, and go take a nap. Set my watch, set my phone to wake me up go back and get my camera. Uh, for Nikon shooters, you don't have the evil eye the camera does. Put a little reflective tape on your tripod leg so we can find it. Spent 45 minutes looking for a Nikon camera two years ago. Mine, all of mine you're gonna see are generally an hour. Uh, and again, I'm starting two hours after sunset two hours before sunrise. I have pushed my ISO above 400. Um, but again, the wider, the better. And you can do your math with that higher exposures. So what happens if you don't face north? This is an hour. It's that same delicate arch picture you saw. Uh, look how long those trails are. These are an hour. If I was going to stay two hours, they'd be twice as long, three hours, three times. You know, again, uh, you can stay out there and they'll be as long. So you don't have to worry about it. But I like using the North Star for composition. So if you don't have an app for that or your phone's not working, the easy way is the Big Dipper points at the North Star. And the little dipper. So I have not been to the southern hemisphere, so I can't tell you, but I think they have a similar role. Uh, so I like using that as a compositional element in my images. So here you go. I'm standing there. They allowed us the light paint at the time. This is my high X ISO exposure test, and I'm like, oh, where's Waldo? You know. In New Jersey, I'm the only one who actually, you know, you saw the Big Dipper, and then that was pretty much it. So fortunately for me, I knew where it was. There it was. Okay. I'll go back. So I liked where that was compositionally. Didn't like the painting on the monolith. So I asked my friend and said, hey, paint with me. And we painted, I think, a whopping eight minutes. Walked back to the car, 
napped for 45 minutes, alarm went off, and hiked back up there. Look at the colors you have. This is one of the big things that I want to tell people. I've seen stacked images of star trails. For the record, I've never taken a star trail image over 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But you have blues, you have reds, you have all other colors. And when you stack trails, you lose that. So, again, this is Park Avenue out in Arches. It's massive. I tried light painting it 12 years ago with Thorax. It was horrible. Decided, what the heck? I'm going to turn my ISO up to 400. There's the result. This is probably 4 o'clock in the morning-ish. I did not see the rising sun on the horizon. The camera picked it up. But again, I want you to notice the color in the star trails. Uh, yeah, people who stack, you know, this is probably 20, 30 degrees. I'm 100 yards away sleeping in my car. I've got the reds, the pinks, you know, the blues. That's what star trails look like. It catches the color of the stars. And so I'm going to go there to there. This to me was not stacked. This is me over processing an image. I process my sky separately from the foreground as a skyline arch. Obviously, I got too aggressive with a levels layer. But this is what I generally see with stacked images, the stars are all white. They are not. They have all this color in them. So you're going to read online that, oh, you're going to hurt your camera. You're going to, I've been doing this for a decade and a half. No, you're not. The new cameras especially. But again, Keep it under 60 degrees. Don't go out there on an 80 degree day and try to do a one image star trail. Uh, if you want to do star trails for you, you know, Cranford, Melbourne, go out now. Perfect weather. Um, and since you guys are in New Jersey, uh, I always tell people there's ways around, you know, batteries don't like cold, blah, 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 blah. I know you guys were 40, 50 today, but let's say it was the 10 degree day the other day. Guess what? You know the hand warmers you buy at the store or whatever? Oh, get a couple of them. Rubber band one to your battery compartment, rubber band two of them to your battery compartment to keep your battery semi warm because it'll transfer through it. Rubber band one to your lens, but you don't usually have to do that unless humidity picks up. And there you go. You got a simple solution. Just make sure you didn't move your focus point because that's not going to change. Painting with light where it's allowed. Uh, it's exactly like painting your wall, except you're not neat and slow. You're fast and sloppy. Uh, the closer your subject is to you in the foreground, uh, uh, the less you want to paint it. Um, how fresh are your batteries? Have you been at it all day or all night, for lack of a better word? But by doing those short exposures first, you can realize how long you need to paint. If you were at ISO 6420 seconds, well, okay, now that I'm going to be in an hour, I might pay, have to paint a half hour. Not cool. I might have to use two flashlights, a more powerful flashlight. This is art. There is no science. I can't give you an exact time. But what I can tell you, distance to subject makes a huge difference. The top of this monolith, I'm in the parking lot. This is the back of Courthouse Towers. Uh, I think it's 500 foot taller than me, where I'm standing. 
And I did not even point my flashlight at the foreground bushes. I didn't want you to see the parking lot. Didn't want you to see you anything else. So I'm just moving it real quickly, you know, you know, quickly at the top of that. And the light spill off from my flashlight is painting the shrubs. I could tell you this is a 20 second exposure. I know which lens I used. So for that 20 seconds, I didn't touch any of the lower rocks, nothing. I just tried painting that big monolith. Those silhouetted ones were a quarter mile away from me and wasn't going to bother. You know, what wasn't going to happen. So distance to subject plays a big role. This is what I used to use. One, two, three on the right are gone. I have the three on the left still uh, because sometimes I feel I need an incandescent bulb. I have replaced them with that little one that you saw. But what you didn't see here is a flash. Okay. This was flash. Why no flash? Flash is the most difficult to control pooling of light. White dome geysers, approximately 15, 20 feet tall. The eruption at this size with the plume is probably another 15. So I took a flash, pointed it straight up after I started my exposure, fired it once. I froze the eruption because that's what I wanted to do in this case. All right. But realize distance to subject and all that other stuff comes into play. So now, yes, I was in Florida 30 years ago. I wanted an alligator at night. Um, so I go to this pond. It's a man-made pond. And I pull in, and this guy comes swimming up. He's about a six-footer. Uh, this is probably January, early January. So I knew I didn't have the Milky Way, but I, I wanted an alligator at night. It was my dream. It was what I wanted to do. Uh, my right foot happens to be in the water with the alligator along with my tripod. Uh, yeah, well, okay, we'll talk about it. I looked for mom and dad with the flashlight uh, to make sure there were no other eyes. And I set up, taped my lens. You know, it was already taped. Took the shot with the flashlight, tried to light paint him. Oh, he's moving. The water's moving. He was blurry. But then I remembered that guy that I used for flash. Jumped back in the water, hit the timer, 20 seconds or whatever it was. Standing close to him, hit my flash. Boom, blown out. It's too close to him. Jumped back in the water hit the timer, ran back about 20 feet, popped the flash, there's the result. Distance to subject with the flash is crucial, especially at night. I'm actually gonna run a workshop on this in April to try to recreate this, but whoop, the Milky Way. You know, so, you know, I don't sleep at night since digital. But there you go. That's the things. That's why flash is more difficult to use. But again, if it's a moving subject and moving water, the uh, the lake, uh, you're going to have issues. So there is a time that flash comes becomes useful. Oh wait, I'm going the wrong direction. Partially moonlit. So everything that I've ever done, you know, way back when, decade ago. So this is one of those incandescent bulbs because indoors incandescent bulbs are cool. But I wanted to go back this past year and say, okay, I used the incandescent bulb inside the lights, but now I wanted the Milky Way. So I had to face a different direction. And I used my LED light and a little bit of moonlight to light up the schoolhouse and a church as well, as well as the trees in the foreground. So I've never taken a successful star trail shot from a half to a full moon phase. Light pollution, you go online, look up darkskies.org, wherever you're going, whatever part of the world, they will show you 
uh, what you can do. I've been photographing long enough to do darkroom stuff. So I have tried to burn in camera, uh, even use filters at night and my hand. Uh, so um, many of you know Nick Palmieri. When we did the barn, I tried to cover it. But this, I'm using a split neutral density filter upside down because I had a half moon. And I'm moving it in front of my lens uh, that way, up and down to try to minimize the line that you would have seen. So that foreground was so much brighter. But this image in particular is the one that led me to, oh, wait, there's new ideas. We, we've got new options now. Uh, but if you can't, moving it up and down, being close to the lens, I recommend, you know, and this is my son modeling it for me, get a black felt glove and then you don't need to be that close. But I have totally new recommendation for you now. This is a full moon at noble light. This is why I told you, look at the moon phases. I have one, two, three, four, four five, uh, a dozen, two dozen stars that I can see during a full moon. You're better off going with little to no moon. This is out in Rhode Island. There was zero moon. This is one of my pet peeves, though. This was lit by the city. Yes, thank you very much. This is in a blend. One for the beam of light, one for the stars, and one for the foreground. The foreground was blood red. So I know you all here, you're supposed to get a red headlamp, red headlamp, red headlamp. No, 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 no. Stop. That's for astronomy people. Uh, that foreground was as red as Martian rock, which took me a while to clean up in post-processing. If you had a white headlamp on or a white light, uh, I can clean that up or tone it down in two seconds. Um, so when you walk out with your headlamp to a location, point it down, you know, walk out there, make sure you set up, make sure you're comfortable, turn it off. Now use your flashlight to compose, because here you were able to. And again, but in this case, you had to blend exposures. You were not able to get it in one shot. So again, red headlamps, you're going to have to clean up red in the foreground. So. Again, Pemaquid Point, uh, this was during COVID. I was a little bit stir crazy. Those little streaks of light, I did one for the beam of light, one for the uh, Milky Way. Uh, the little V you see is from the mullions from where the lens is turning on. I timed it for only one of those beams of light and not even the full thing. And that's how bright it is. So every time the light would come on, I would cover my lens with my hand. Every time it went off, I'd take it off. And basically you're getting those beams because of the uh, humidity off the ocean. So that's humidity in the atmosphere. So I've gotten really good with bending the rules, twisting the rules, adapting the rules over the last decade. So there's a thing called low-level light painting. I don't understand what it is. I don't believe it. But supposedly is you're allowed to use a two-lumen flashlight to paint your subject. I, I couldn't see it. They say dogs can see it. Other nocturnal creatures can see it, doesn't bother them. Uh, this is what somebody put under Mesa Arch for us. I'm still not 100% sure if it was a low-level light source, um, but I didn't see that glow on the bottom of Mesa Arch. 
So uh, still not sold on it. But this guy that was painting here looked like he was using a normal headlamp, LED headlamp, bouncing it off of uh, white foam core. So now when I rent a car, I rent a white Suburban, uh, if I ever can, or white whatever big SUV, because I started the shot walked away to the Suburban and it was a white Suburban. Like, just like I was going back to the truck and checking for something and I shined my headlamp at the truck and this is the result. So again, the long exposure gives you the streaks on the steam, just like long exposure on water. Uh, but again, there's, there's ways that you can figure it out. And for the record, I think the park service, you got to look this up. I haven't checked it in a while. It's only commercial use authorizers, which is me, are not allowed to do it, but individuals are. So just check though. And bottom line, this is probably three o'clock in the morning. I haven't seen a ranger in a long time. But here's the funny part. Remember I told you to compose at ISO 25,600. That gives you how long a formula of how long you need to expose for the foreground. Because most of the time what I do, set it to ISO 25.6, take the picture, my sky is totally blown out. But how does my foreground look? Okay, does my foreground look good? Remember, you don't trust your eyes at night because bottom line is you, you're getting your night vision uh, and noise shows up in a dark area. I would rather you have a little lighter foreground that you can work on and then darken it. So you're definitely going to want to take a picture of this because at 2 o'clock in the morning, you don't want to do math. So this is a two exposure blend where one's for the foreground at 25,600 at ISO 1600, my foreground at 25.6 at 20 seconds look good. Here I adjusted for perspective, but there's your math. At 20, remember this is a 20 millimeter lens. You might have to adjust this but definitely take a picture for that because if at 20 seconds that foreground looks good, if I drop it to ISO 1600, I'm going to be open for five minutes plus. If I want to drop it less, 10 minutes plus. But it looked good at ISO 3200. Remember, this is a 20 millimeter lens I'm talking about. These are starting points. You, but now you could take one picture for the sky at 20 seconds, one at six minutes for the foreground. So on my six, but you remember you go from 20 seconds to bulb, cable release, five minutes. I set my phone, set my Timex. All right, get it. Now, when I get home, you can't move your tripod. You can't, you know, don't move it. Don't move anything. They're just back to back. So my five, six minute picture of the foreground, foreground may look a little bright. Okay, work on the foreground. Darken the whole foreground to what it looks like nighttime. The sky is totally blown out and I blow it out totally just to make sure. Now my sky looks perfect. Foreground looks like a silhouette, pitch black. Select subject. It picks the sky. Copy. Paste it on the other one. Move it into position. You have a perfect match between. And this to me looks more naturally moonlit, starlit than what I could do with light painting. And this thing was massive. 
So again, where I'm allowed to light paint, I'll do both. I'll light paint and then I won't. And I've gotten totally crazy now with what digital can allow us to do. Um, so if you shoot Mount Rainier, this happens to be a 20 millimeter lens. I know your Milky Way is going to look awesome. This is probably about 1040 at night. It was going to be behind the mountain shortly. Um, you know, I used photo pills to figure it out. The, the fields in front of me were filled with lupin. But at 20 millimeter, the lupin would look about yay big. I'd have little purple dots. I said, okay, I'm not bound by any rules now being a photographer. I said, let's see how crazy you can get, Roman. I drove up there for sunset. This is the uh, Sunrise Visitor Center. Um, and as soon as the sun set, I went into the field where I knew I was going to be standing photographing Mount Rainier at night. And I took out my 24 to 105 millimeter, placed it horizontally, because I knew that tree line was going to be very dark, and took a picture of the lupin underexposing them at 105 millimeter. Took the shot of 20 millimeter of Mount Rainier in the stars, dropped the lupin in there horizontally, had to clean up a little bit of that tree line. Now you see the lupin, and now you have Mount Rainier. This is what my eye see. My eye doesn't see like a 20 millimeter lens. So for me, this was more close to reality. And oh, for the record, your eye doesn't see the Milky Way that way either. Your camera does. You've got lenses. You're there. You spent the time to go to take the shot twice, three times. This is 14 millimeters. This is light pollution, uh, lighting uh, the watchman and the river and everything. I personally like the tighter view of that. But who cares? 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 40 seconds, and plus another 20 seconds to change my lens, I can choose. And, you know, maybe one day I feel better about another image. Take the shot. You spent the time to get there, take the shot. And now this is where the settings change, and usually why I don't like including it. Aurora Borealis is based on a scale. And it's based from K1 through 9. In my lifetime of chasing auroras, the highest I've seen is a K7, which is visible to the naked eye. I've seen K1s that and twos and threes that basically look like a cloud or fog in the sky at night. You really can't see them. But if you see something like, does that look like a cloud? Take the shot. So you can go online, NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and they usually have the scale of what the aurora will be that night and where. And this happens to be Iceland. We knew that this, this is a K5, which is huge in most cases. But again, I had to take two images, one for the foreground, one for the sky. And I'm not taking 20-second exposures for the aurora. Why? It looks too milky for lack of a better word the greens get blown out everything gets blown out it, it just starts becoming one hot mess but 20 seconds was perfect for the foreground so i took two exposures for that so this is again another two exposure blend this is two minutes for the foreground and mount kirchafell and 20 seconds, no, eight seconds, five seconds for the aurora so that you could see the bands, you could see the color. But trust me, this was a K3. I could not see that magenta. 
it looked like it was just the fog going over there. But after having done this for a while, I knew what I was looking at. Auroras, one through six seconds max. Anything over that, they start looking ugly. So you're going to have to adjust your shutter speed, your ISO. If it's too dark, adjust your ISO. I'm usually for auroras in a K7 range, dropping it down to ISO 400, 600, 800. It's a game of how intense the aurora is. And good thing is, one to six seconds too dark, raise your ISO. Three seconds, raise your ISO. You know, so now you can quickly adjust and you're not wasting that much time. Uh, this, unfortunately, was over the North Atlantic, not over anything. This is the strongest aurora I've ever seen. It's a K7. Uh, you could see it with your naked eye. It was changing by the second. It lasted about half hour, 45 minutes. Still one of the most breathtaking things I've ever, ever seen. So let's put it all together. Winter time, I tell you, go chase, you know, star trails. Like I said, this was an F4 lens. Now, if you go, I would say late April, late May, you're going to get a better Milky Way. Just realize that today you're going to be there with 500 other people, probably not the end of the world. And you won't break your neck. It is a mile and a half hike steep at elevation, but it's doable. So this is a decade old picture. So look at Thor's hammer out in Zion National Park. And for the record, our parks do not close at night. Uh, this in the middle-ish part of the frame is Thor has hammer. I drop down to get the Milky Way. And remember I talked to you about those uh, red headlamps? Uh, there was a couple of guys 100 plus feet above me and about 100 yards behind me having a conversation with their red headlamps on. That monolith to the left looked like it was Martian. So I said, okay. One minute goes by, two minutes go by. I finally had to yell at them to turn their red headlamps because it was looking like Mars. They obliged. And two exposure blend. Four minutes for the foreground, five minutes, 20 seconds for the sky. So this was they allowed light painting, F4 lens. Uh, no more light painting, low level LED light that somebody had put there. A little moonlight, which again, showing you the canyon behind and the watcher women and lighting up Mesa Arch. Again, a sliver of moon is my favorite. This big, massive monolith outside of Cayenta was lit by a street lamp. But this is Star Trails, one shot in camera, probably 40, 50 degrees. Look at the color you have in the trails. Winter time, you can go whatever to do this. You're just not going to get the same stars or the Milky Way. This is the northern end. Uh, but, you know, again, doesn't matter what time of year it is, you can get this. This is White Dome Geyser again. Uh, the reason your foreground is dark is White Dome Geyser is 30 feet away from me, but my camera is literally in a puddle by the side of the road pothole. And I knew if I had put a light on the foreground, it would be soft because it was three, four feet away from me. So moonlit, crescent moon. So whatever the guidebooks tell you is where you want to be for sunrise or sunset, that's where you need to be for moonrise or moonset. 
So if you get the Yellowstone Teton Sky book, it says you need to be at the barns for sunrise. Okay, you're not going to paint the Grand Tetons. This was incandescent light. I did it with a little bit of moonlight, more blue, more natural. Go up to the next barn up the street. Where do you go after that? Schwambacher's Landing. Where do you go after that? Oxbow Bend. This was only about a year and a half ago. You could see the problem with fires. Uh, they were California fires. They weren't even um, Teton fires. Uh, so, but anything you can do at night. Now, look at your daytime guidebooks. So, I'm now trying to recreate everything that I did. The main road runs through Courthouse Towers. It was a whopping 26 degrees this day. So we stayed out by our cameras. If a car happened to drive through, use a black cap, baseball cap, inside of the cap, and cover your lens as the car is driving through. Yes, you'll have a break in your star trails but you won't have to redo the image. You saw my Park Avenue, the first one, I needed the moon a little bit further up straight overhead to light the whole canyon. The road runs through there. So I'm pretty sure right now in the summertime, a ranger goes through every hour and campers are there and everything else like that. So if you want to do star trails, you know, November, December, January, February are probably your friend. Again, sliver of the moon. Look at how it, so when you have a sun low on the horizon, it's going to show you the ripples in the sand. So the same thing happens with the moon. Another lighthouse out in Rhode Island. Two exposure blinds. So this is supposed to be my warning to you guys. So this is late September. Don't have a great uh, Milky Way core. I got there at midnight and there were a thousand people standing near uh, Old Faithful iPads, flashing it, whatever. Said, I'm done with this. It's Old Faithful, 90 minutes, 90 minutes. Did my math, went to do other things and decided to come back at about three o'clock in the morning. So for those of you who have not been there, if you come to the Old Faithful Inn where you can park to go shoot this, uh, there's a stop sign at a T intersection. Uh, it's three o'clock in the morning. I looked right, looked left, did not hit the brakes. I ran the stop sign. Pulled into my parking spot by Old Faithful, and sure enough, Park Service Ranger, you know, uh, you know, what are you doing here? And I said to him, I'm taking pictures. And I showed him the back of my digital camera screen. He goes, that's cool. He goes, you do know that stop signs are stop signs even at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I looked at him, and I go, really? I gave him the Jersey attitude. And he goes, yeah, really? And I look at him, you know, not going to go down quietly yet. And I looked at him and I said, I could see for 10 miles, a light for 10 miles to my left, 10 miles to my right, behind and in front of me. I go, where were you? And what are you doing out here? Doesn't even miss a beat. He goes, waiting for you. So <laughs> as the old song goes, you got to know when to fold them, or when to hold them. So. I just looked at him and I go, he goes, I tell you what, he goes, it looks like you're having a good time out here, but you're going to stop next time, right? And I go, yes, sir. Yeah, I, you know, absolutely gave him my best. And then he goes to me, he goes, I tell you what, I think I saw you tap your brake lights, his exact words. And he goes, so I'm going to let you go for now. <laughs> and he goes, have fun, but make sure you stop. So yes, they're out there even at three o'clock in the morning. So obey the traffic laws. So now I've set up the star points. Now I know I'm facing north. Let me do the trails. So I'm able to get both. For the record, you may be able to get a Milky Way shot out of here with a composite. 
next time I go back, I'm going to try. But realize that you're going to be standing by the North Star. The boardwalk does go away all the way around. But you might have some of the lodges interfering with your shot. But now you can take two shots and blend them. Three shots and blend them. Partially moonlit. Again, Bryce National Park. Uh, this is my favorite. I'm trying to redo everything. The orange glow on the horizon, white glow on the left, light pollution, you know, I'm not that worried about it anymore. It still looks cool. It's all about where it is. White pocket, where I'm allowed to paint. So this one actually is a two exposure blend, two exposure blend, and again, two exposure blends. So now I'm finding this much more favorable for realistic looking images. But everybody, a lot of people I see shoot landscapes horizontal, horizontal, horizontal. I get it. I'm going to tell you, do both. Do both. You know, you're there. You took the time. Do both. And figure it out when you get home. So this one is probably from a little bit earlier before uh, from there. And again, one of the few times that light pollution has saved me, uh, but it was still, I had to do a longer exposure on the foreground. And on that, I'll finish for questions. You guys already got all that good, good stuff. Did Ellen fall asleep on me? Should I start to stop the recording? Anybody I, have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, Roman, I, I do. Um, question. So how do you process the uh, your Milky Way shots? Um, do you use Lightroom? Do you use Photoshop? And what's your what's your processing to get the, the stars to, to stand out? Okay. So I can tell you that I I usually process, and by usually I mean 99% of the time, foreground separate from the sky, whether right. it's a single image or not. Sorry, so, I'm in a sip of water. Uh, so your camera by design, every camera in the world is trying to make gray, you know, not quite there. So when you separate or isolate your uh, Milky Way images in particular, so you, you choose out the sky, you know, we're going to worry about the foreground in a minute. Um, I tend to run, um, I, I use Photoshop only. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. all I do. Well, no, that's not true because I use Topaz Labs and whatever, but that's only for sharpening and eliminating noise. But I use Photoshop. So when I get, I see the sky as um, black, not blue, or very dark at the best, okay? Unless it's blue hour. So for me, I'll take a level levels layer and hold down, I'm a Mac user option key, so I think it's control on a PC, mm -hmm. and take the level slider. So I'll select the Milky Way by itself first, and hold that key down to make sure I don't have any massive blown areas because the core, the galactic core can get blown out. So I might actually take a layer, uh, get the core and say, okay, let me hit it with the brightness contrast layer to tone the core down and then select the entire Milky Way. Again, I do sloppy lassos and I blur the mask. Um, and then I'll hit it with a levels layer holding down the option key for me until I have the whites white. Again, they're stars and, you know, in the Milky Way. I'm not looking for the color. And then I'll move my mid-tone slider to pop that contrast. Then I select inverse and I'll darken the rest of the sky with the same uh -huh. levels layer adjustment. So there okay. is a little bit playing there, but 
you know, you want to make that Milky Way shine, especially the core. And I find that either brightness contrast layers or levels layers, that core, though, has a very, very bright area that can get away from you really quick. Right. Uh, so tone it down first or exclude it from your levels layer, whatever you choose. Uh, I, I usually tend to tone that down first. Because again, I see it as black or very dark, you know. So darkening that galactic core makes it pop. And then you set the rest of the sky and start with a levels layer. Again, make sure your whites aren't too crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, again, you, you can let them go white and then mid-tone slider. And if you have to, the, my last resort is the black slider to really darken. Great. Thank you so much. No problem. Are there any other questions for Roman? It's a night program. I put them all to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a great program. Right. Yeah. Excellent. I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. <laughs> yes. Thank you. You're welcome. And if there are no other questions, uh, I'll say good night to everybody. Uh, or if they forgot, you, they know they can email me. So there you go. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Really good, Roman. Thanks.